Yeah, you already mentioned the data scientists. They are, of course, a group being addressed here. Data scientists want to be able to, let's say, analyze even huge amount of data, maybe heterogene from coming from heterogeneous sources. Uh, Grass is able to, let's say, to funnel this into one system to do the data cleanup at the same time, as I already mentioned. It's very interoperable, uh, so you're not limited to Grass if you want to bring it into a different final visualization system, no problem with that. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Marcus Niedler. He is the founder of a company called Mondialis and he is the Project Steering Committee Chairman of the Grass GIS Project. GrassGIS is a free and open source geospatial software. It has a rich history, a lot of functionality, and it probably doesn't get the attention it deserves. Thank you so much, OSGO, for helping make this podcast episode possible. I really, really appreciate your support. Welcome to the podcast, Marcus. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We, we've had a, a previous conversation around grass and it was really eye-opening. So I, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it and of course sharing that with the audience. I think just before we jump into grass GIS as a project and as a, a piece of software, I think it would be really useful and helpful for, for the audience if we just could get an understanding of your background. How did you get involved in grass and, and how did you get involved in, in geospatial in general? Hello, Daniel. Thank you for the invitation to this podcast. Yeah, well, I'm involved in the Grass GIS project already for a very long time. I started back in the 90s, early 90s, as a, as a student helper at the university, trying to explore this software. The idea was to understand if it is a reliable software to be used in teaching and uh, in research. I was involved, as I said, as a student. Then I finished my studies. I moved into science, into academia, worked for 15 years in Italy, in Trento, in Northern Italy, in a research foundation. And everywhere we use grass for infectious disease monitoring, for satellite data processing and so on. And it's always very nice when you are able to co-develop the software you are using to bring it forward, to see that it grows, that other people use it and so on. And importantly, the software is not my invention. It has been there already for 15 years or so before I even knew about it. It's uh, coming from the old days in the 80s, and uh, since then it is existing. Thank you very much for for sharing some of your background with us. But I feel like we've perhaps jumped in a little bit deep here. Maybe we could uh, back up a step here and explain what is grass. So th- so this is a geospatial podcast. We've been talking about software. People will understand that this is some kind of GIS software, but perhaps you could put a few more words around what, what grass is. Yes, of course. So the acronym stands for Geographic Resources Analysis Support System, a very long one, commonly called GRASS or GRASS GIS which is an open source software. It exists, as I mentioned, already for 35 or more years, which is like outstanding because it is an open source software originally developed by the U.S. Army. And since uh, the, let's say, early 90s developed in academia and even later uh, with the uh, advent of uh, Internet communities developed like in a global team. It's a software which does a lot of different things. It's a powerful raster vector and geospatial processing engine, means uh, you can do all sorts of analysis there. Maybe we come to it a bit later. Uh, There are really plenty of applications existing. And you can consider it as a kind of toolbox, uh, which comes with a tool for uh, more or less uh, most of the geospatial topics. Importantly, you can use it on a desktop or a workstation, a laptop, whatever you like, like a standalone application with a graphical user interface or like a standard GIS software. Additionally, it is also used as a backend in many projects, different projects. I mean, you can use it from QGIS, another well-known open source uh, software tool. There under processing, you have the access, uh, access to much of the grass functionality. You can use the R geostatistical software. Uh, There's a bridge to it, or you can even use it in the cloud. There is um, 
a new uh, software, also a OSGEO community project called Actinia, uh, which enables you to run uh, GRASS analysis in the cloud. GRASS is a founding member of the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, OSGEO, uh, which was established uh, in 2006 and is, of course, an important part, a project uh, of this uh, software foundation, which also grew quite a bit. The software is developed, uh, as I mentioned, in the internet, through the internet on GitHub. Um, so we are using modern technology for the development, for the review of the changes, for releasing new uh, versions and so on, packaging whatsoever. And I would say the 35 plus years show that a lot of fancy algorithms could be included. Optimization happens all over the time. If things happen in the geospatial world, the GRASS project seeks to uh, pick this up like new formats, uh, new ideas, new algorithms, they are integrated. And it's an, a community project which is open to uh, everybody, but it's also used in commercial uh, settings, not only academia, also in business, where it is the backend for analysis. Thank you very much for that. I'm, I just want to summarize a little bit here for the listeners. So we have this open source uh, geospatial software, GIS software called GRASS. It's got a long history um, it, it has a ton of functionality for raster and, and vector data. We can get to it from, from different places. I know that a lot of the functionality is integrated in, in QGIS, for example. You mentioned a couple of programming languages there, R, and I'm sure there's a, there's a connection or a bridge to, to Python as well, so we can access the functionality that way. There's a user interface as well. One thing I want to talk about in, in terms of, of GRASS, and this is from my personal experience with it, is that I found it a little bit confusing at the start. So when you open the, the user interface, if you're running it as a, a desktop uh, application, there's something called a directory, a location, and a map set. Would you mind walking the, the audience through uh, what these things are and, and why they're necessary? Yeah, sure. We have... In the first place, like in any GIS, you, you will have to store your data somewhere. Um, we call this GRASS database. This is basically a folder or directory somewhere sitting on your disk or on your network drive, wherever it is, and you have to organize your data somehow. And most people probably think along the lines of projects. So this is my folder for project A, and this is folder project B, and so forth. Uh, we call this locations. This is a slang which comes from the uh, initial days of uh, GRASS development that was called locations, and we kept it like that. Uh, so you can probably say it's a synonym uh, project and location is the same thing, where a folder, which is a folder or many folders where geospatial data are stored. There's one important thing about these locations. A location can usually uh, relates to one geographic place or area uh, of your interest. We could also define this place as large as the globe. So we have a global location. By the way, you can also use Mars data. So if you want to change the planet, no problem, uh, you can do that. And within the location, the data are stored, as I mentioned. But importantly, in one location, you can have only one coordinate reference system. You may think this is a kind of limitation, but it's also an I the idea of keeping data clean to avoid mixing and those who are deep into or more deep into GIS data analysis though know if you reproject data, there are all kinds of things to be considered like precision, like uh, resampling with raster data, which resampling method is the right one and so on. You need to be a bit careful if you want to do it right. And so the decision was, and this was not touched so far, uh, in one location we have one coordinate reference system as a, uh, the, the, major, uh, the main one. But if you come with data uh, which arrive in a different uh, coordinate uh, reference system projection, then you can reproject that on the fly. As a summary, location is a, a kind of folder in which the data are stored. And then within that, there's a so-called map set or many map sets to even uh, organize better your data. So now you said uh, when you start GRASS, you come you are presented with this startup screen where you have to say which location do you want to use and which map set. That is more or less the idea to, to show you uh, uh, the folder structure and ask you which one do you want to use. We are currently working on a different version. It will be uh, likely GRASS uh, 8.0. 
And there we are abandoning this uh, welcome screen and you just start grass as you start most of the other GIS. You are presented with the menu and then you can do things with your data. So we are a bit inverting the order, but uh, essentially the management will remain the same. Uh, there's one thing to know. Grass data are coming in their own format. There's many uh, existing formats out there. And GRASS, amusingly, is one of them because it exists already since the 80s. But it has never been standardized at international level to become a formal one like GeoTIFF or GeoPackage or Shapefile. The GRASS format is similar to that, but it's just not uh, really exposed like that. Uh, why do we keep that? Because for more or less every format has to come with some limitations. And the GRASS format is a better representation in many regards, which, uh, let's say, help you to minimize the loss uh, when you store your data. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, we have this location and map sets, and we can understand these as projects. The location is limited to uh, one projection, but everything is projected on the fly. And so when I import data into a, a location, I, I have the option of, of reprojecting that into that location and then it exists there. And I'm assuming now I can take any file I want, so a, a shape file, for example, import it into this location, uh, make sure the projection is correct f in regards to that location and it'll be converted into the, this grass format. What, what advantages do I get with this grass format? You mentioned something about the, the size and storing data effectively. But I also know from a previous conversation that there's something around the, the vector topology engine of GRASS. Could you talk to that, please? Yeah, of course. So um, a vector topology engine is something uh, very interesting. There have been more topological GIS out there in the past. Uh, this was a kind of, let's say, abandoned when it came to simple features, the simple features idea, which, of course, comes also with some advantages. But we should probably uh, explain first what topology really means uh, for vector data. So imagine two adjacent parcels. It could be some land use parcels, agricultural fields, or something like that, that are next to each other, and they share one border. In simple features format, you would uh, digitize two lines there, two borders uh, between the fields. So it means each parcel comes with a complete border. In a topological model, this theoretically shared border is also really physically shared because there's only a single line. It means the common border between the two adjacent fields is one line and not two lines. Sounds simple, but it is uh, less so because when you digitize generate data, often in a non-topological model, the lines do not really match. You have to be very precise when you set your lines and your vector points, the vertices, one on the other, and so on. But unfortunately, this doesn't always happen. And we have uh, plenty of data out there. Uh, you will also find them on official sites, maybe administrative boundaries, which are not digitized properly, where you have topological errors. There may be like small overlaps or slivers, uh, that is small holes between uh, these uh, shared lines. This is a big problem, and especially with political relevant data or cadastral data, it's not uh, a good idea to have those issues. So here uh, the topological model comes into place. You have only one line, and through that you cannot have errors here. This is quite interesting. And the big advantage is when you import uh, data into GRASS, uh, vector data in this case, which have topological errors like overlaps and so forth, uh, the engine will tell you, the GRASS engine will tell you, look, here's an error, please fix it. Or uh, you can also automatically fix that uh, with some uh, snapping engine, which is included, and removal of duplicate lines and so forth. There are plenty of tools included. Uh, thanks to that, uh, you can clean up your data while importing them. Yeah, GRASS does a bit more than that. The topological data are important, for, especially for areas. You have also uh, the possibility to store 3D data, means vector lines which are inclined, uh, which is relevant for all kinds of questions. And in the format, it's planned but not yet implemented. There are also 3D corpus there, which you could also store with topology. We can do that already, but it's uh, not yet uh, following the topological paradigm. 
So a, a couple of questions spring to mind here. And the first one being, we're, we're talking about the, the, the lines, so that the actual geometries here that are being corrected as they come into the grass engine, or, or you have the option of automatically correcting them. Does that also mean that I am building a data model in the background? So I'm calculating these topological attributes for, for each feature that's coming in, so they know each other's neighbors, for example? That is right. For example, in a, in a simple feature model, you don't really know what your neighbor is because you are a self-contained polygon, an area, a closed line, uh, and you do not know anything about your neighbors. Is there a neighbor at all? Who is the neighbor? And so forth. No idea. In a topological model with a shared boundary, or yes, the, the common border between the two adjacent uh, polygons, you know that because when we are importing the data, we look at it like a ring and we follow the ring unless we reach the starting point and we know what is left and right. Grass also stores a centroid uh, inside the ring and to, f uh, to form an area, we have a closed ring with a centroid inside. And of course, in the model itself, this is also important for st uh, attaching the attributes. So the attributes attached to that, the attribute table, the entries there, you can even attach multiple attribute tables if you have the need. And through that, you know everything also about uh, maybe the uh, site length, which is shared, uh, and other information which are related to geometry. So that this must have some sort of performance implications later on, because all this, I'm, I'm assuming anyway, is immediately available to me. It's calculated on input, so it's not something I need to generate if I want to do an analysis. Is that correct? That is correct. It is generated during import or if you digitize data inside or you vectorize raster data or do any other data creation task within GRASS, then it is immediately generated in the topological format. What happens on export? So I, I bring my data in, let's say it's a shapefile again, I can clean it in this way, I can generate this topological model of it uh, and, I can, and I'm assuming it's maintained when I'm doing my edits. Can I export it out to anything or is it stuck in that format now? It's definitely not stuck. Uh, we have uh, export functionality there and we rely on GDAL OGR for our, uh, inter uh, let's say, interfacing with uh, the external world for raster and vector data. So in this case, OGR does the job to translate the topological model back into simple features. And through that, we can write out in more or less any format you can imagine because OGR supports really, really a lot of them. Shapefile, GeoPackage, uh, whatever you can imagine. Earlier in the conversation, you talked a little bit about uh, the, this GRASS data model. So we've talked about the, the GRASS data model for vector data. Is there something similar for raster data? Is there something that's calculated on import that's immediately available to me when I'm, I'm using raster data? Yeah, with raster data, it's... Uh probably a little bit easier because in the end we import a kind of grid or a, a matrix which comes like in a GeoTIFF format or HDF or whatever it is. GRASS has its own raster engine again like with a vector engine with the advantage that uh, limitations like we have in GeoTIFF that you cannot attach uh, color tables to floating point maps and so on is uh, not there. Such limit uh, limitations we do not have. We have a 2D raster engine there. We have also, interestingly, a multi-layer engine, so you can stack imagery like it happens with multi-band aerial or satellite imagery. But you can also, what is quite interesting, uh, stack uh, time series. So when you have time series, like we achieve nowadays with the satellite data, the operational one like Landsat, Sentinel, and so on, uh, you can put them into a time series and you do, uh, can do all the computation on top of that. For example, uh, if you uh, look at temperature data, this could also come origin from uh, climatic stations and so on. If you have a stack of raster maps and each of it is maybe the daily temperature in each uh, pixel, then you can easily compute aggregates like uh, what is the average weekly temperature or the minimum monthly or annual or decadal and so on. You can easily, uh, from this uh, bunch of input maps, generate uh, aggregated output and, of course, do much more complex things than I just mentioned. Uh, finally, we have a voxel engine that is Raster 3D. That means we can store volumetric pixels, uh, X, Y, Z, uh, which is quite nice when you want to store 
uh, soil profiles or atmospheric profiles or even medical scans. So imagine uh, we are not limited to environmental data. We can uh, also do uh, import of maybe brain scans and then reconstruct uh, 3D uh, volumetric model and visualize that. In terms of the functions available in GRASS, does it matter, like are there specific functions for 2D or 3D or do they just work on whatever they're pointed at? Well, there are specific functions for sure. So we have really huge application set uh, related to raster and vector 2D data. We have uh, more limited uh, because it's more complex, but also with uh, maybe less uh, need of uh, functionality uh, sets for volumetric raster and 3D vector data and then additionally for time series. So uh, maybe coming a bit to uh, the set of applications, uh, some, some examples. Imagine uh, the solar radiation. We have a lot of dedicated tools uh, in GRASS. As an example, solar radiation, we can compute the instant uh, influx of uh, energy on the surface. So imagine you have an elevation model, uh, then you can uh, compute over time, how much energy will reach it. We can even do a normalization or a correction for clouds if you have cloud cover data available. But if you have an, a surface model, which also includes the houses, then you can take care of that. And uh, the inclination of roofs, for example, would be considered. So this is not a pure 3D application, but it's a, we call it 2.5D. It's a surface, but a surface with uh, which describes also houses and other uh, objects which are on the Earth's surface, and this can be used as well. Same thing applies when uh, when you do hydrological modeling, for example, flood modeling. Then you also uh, you may also include uh, buildings here, and these buildings will be considered when you, when you do your surface flow uh, and so forth. In the three D world, last example, we have uh, groundwater flow. We can do groundwater modeling. Uh, here it's also uh, interesting to look at the true 3D passage and here the 3D raster engine uh, comes into place. I, I realise now up in, uh, that we've been talking about uh, flat files, so importing you know, things into GRASS and, and doing our work from there. Well, what does the GRASS ecosystem look like? Can I connect this to a Postgres database, for example? Can I use uh, web services in, in GRASS? Yes, you can. So uh, the import of data is only half of the truth, let's say. If you have uh, huge amounts of data, especially with uh, raster data, it can uh, nowadays quickly accumulate. Uh, you have the alternative, uh, rather than importing it, uh, to uh, avoid duplication of uh, disk space consumption, uh, you can also register those data. That means you tell GRASS, look, here is the GeoTIFF file. I use GeoTIFF as an example. Uh, here's the GeoTIFF file, please use it. And the registration happens uh, like a link, and GRASS considers this being a true raster map being imported, but it is not. It is just sitting over there, and there's the link. The, the speed penalty is really low, so you do not really realize that unless the file is remotely stored and you have to retrieve everything over network. But nowadays, even with a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF and so on, we are... Uh, seeing a lot of improvement here. What else do we have? Uh, web services. So OGC web services are also supported. We have uh, the possibility to uh, read data from WMS, uh, from WFS. So WMS for raster data, WFS for vector data, and uh, web coverage service as well. And this gives you the possibility either to uh, show such data uh, in the display so if you want to have a backdrop map, for example, but you can also truly save them in GRASS itself. So in case you, for analytical reasons, want to retrieve those data into your own database from the remote service, uh, OGC service, then you can do so. And uh, so you ask about PostGIS, we can read and write uh, to PostGIS. Uh, that is no problem. And also here, OGR is the interface eventually to make this happen, to translate between the topological engine uh, of GRASS-GIS and the usually non-topological engines out there or databases out there. 
while we're talking about the ecosystem, now is probably a really good time to sort of talk in a little bit more detail about the the programming interfaces to Grass. So earlier on, you mentioned R, and I'm not sure if you mentioned Python, but I could imagine Python is one of them. Is there any other ways of getting at, at Grass functionality? I didn't mention Python yet, but I must underline that uh, probably nowadays one third of Grass is written in Python. So Python is a key part of the system. We have uh, several interfaces available. Uh, that means that, well, you can write your, your Python script if you want so, and you will say import the Grass library, and then you have the functionality available. There's one uh, on the pip server, there's one library called Grass Session, which is very handy. Uh, you just uh, use that, and from there you can do straight away your the usage of the Grass functionality, even without uh, personally having started Grass. So you can use it as a backend there. If you want to develop additional functionality or combine existing tools, then you can write up your Grass script. There's one thing uh, in Python. You can also do this in Shell. Uh, you can write in C. You can write in C++. There are also people who have used it for uh, in Octave or even PHP. Uh, so there are basically no limitations. Uh, one thing which I would like to mention, which is really, really specific, special, and very, very handy, is the parser. We have an included parser. What does a parser do? If a user comes and says, uh, please execute this functionality, and by the way, use that input map, then we need something which is doing the communication. And uh, let's say on command line, uh, you enter a command into the terminal, can be on any operating system, uh, you enter the command and then the system has to read this. And this is done by a so-called parser. And Grass comes with its own powerful parser, which is uh, specific to Grass and it's able to understand parameters, distinguish flags. It doesn't uh, mind if you mix the order. Uh, it can tell you, look, this is a parameter you have to specify, it's mandatory or it can put default values where it is not needed, but you, let's say, usually go with one default value. And all this is done uh, by this parser. This parser you can include in your scripts, uh, whatever language it is. And from there, it can do a lot of stuff besides just understanding what the user wants, because it can generate also uh, output. It can generate uh, the description of the script you have just, a machine-readable description, of what you have just programmed in XML, which can be then used uh, elsewhere in other software or in WPS style. It can also, if you are lazy uh, like me and you want to do something similar to what is already there and you do not want to write it all yourself, you just call uh, an existing script with a, a parameter and it will, will output um, this script in shell style or in Python style. And then you can just copy paste from there and continue to extend it to your functionality. And also the Grass user interface, it uh, partially exists, but a lot of it is just generated on the fly. Um, so all the buttons are generated also thanks to this parser with a related button uh, generate library, let's call it, but the description, how the button should look like and where they should be, is also done uh, uh, inside the parser. And the last example is that, um, we can write out JSON. I mentioned in the beginning that we have support for, um, or let's say, uh, available uh, software which is called Actinia. You find it also on GitHub. The process chains, if you want to do process chains, uh, generate process chains and use them in the cloud, um, you do not have to write everything yourself, but you can just tell the parser, uh, today no Python, but please generate a JSON style, and then it will output your script, which you probably wrote in Shell or in Python, it will output in JSON and then you can uh, drop it to the cloud. I just want to make sure that, that I'm, I'm clear on this. And again, from previous experience with Grass, I know that there's a user interface so I can push buttons and I can use the, the GUI to, to select and build up programs, execute functions, that kind of thing. And I, I know that there is a almost like a command line built into Grass. Are we talking about the, the Grass command line here where I can enter those, those scripts or I can see my, the, the functions that I've executed as scripts in that command line and then say to the command line, hey, command line, give me this in Python, give me this in, in JSON, uh, export this as something else. Is that what we're talking about here? 
Yes, that's exactly right. So imagine uh, you are using Grass for the first time. You started up with a demo data set, which you can uh, download. There's a button for it in the welcome screen. Uh, you fetch the demo uh, data set and you start Grass. And then you go and say, okay, I want to see some map, like a roadmap, elevation model, whatever is there. So you click in the menu on uh, on the button to display a map. You pick the map and uh, look at it. And this this dialog which asks you which map do you want to see, um, it has a copy button. And this copy button is showing you the command line because in the end, the graphical user interface is internally also using the command line. It's just not shown to the user in a clear way. Uh, if you want so, you can see it, but it's, let's say, in the first place, it's kind of hidden. And then uh, you can could also copy over this command and put it into the terminal and run it there, and it would do exactly the same thing. So this is a so-called shell command. But if you then say you want to see it in Python style, then it will write out uh, the style, uh, the, let's say this command in Python, and you could copy it over to a Python script. Same thing with the JSON, same thing with XML, HTML, and so on. We also have a graphical modeler included in the user interface where you could graphically combine commands and create your workflow. Let's say import data, do something with those data and uh, generate a report and store the report as a plot or a CSV file. Uh, this you see graphically, you can execute it and you see the results, but there's also an export to Python uh, button there. And so you could be, you would be able to write out your first ever Python script like that. And this could then be run again as a standalone command. So I think by now the, the listeners will understand that, that Grass is an open source piece of software. We can get to it from a lot of different programming languages. It, it has a ton of functionality. It does interesting things with the uh, vector topology when we import it. It has a really, really good understanding of how data should be stored and we can import and export you know, a variety of different formats. Um, I know from a previous conversation that it's it's got a very small memory footprint. It's it's a very fast when, when it when it executes. But one thing we haven't talked about so far in the conversation, which I think is becoming an increasingly important for for data scientists, is visualization of data. Is there an opportunity here to visualize data in Grass? Yes, definitely. There's as we call it Grass Monitor, so it's a graphical output interface like uh, in any GIS with the usual buttons and uh, legend, uh, map, uh, styling, and so forth. You can also, if you, um, let's say, all the display part is like in any GIS. So you can display your data. There's a 3D viewer. You can also view your volumetric data there and so on. If you digitize uh, with a digitizer, then you have the possibility to check on the fly. It will show you if your data are topologically correct or not. With colors, red is not correct, green is correct. And you can query data, you can query plot time series, you can do yeah, basically all kinds of plotting. If you say, well, that's nice, but I would I prefer to uh, view it elsewhere, then you have the possibility to export to Paraview. That's also a very powerful uh, open source visualization tool. You can also use, as I mentioned, interface to R, you can interface to QGIS, uh, there's the possibility to run it in Jupyter Notebook. So if you prefer Jupyter Notebooks, you can connect to that as well. And probably uh, the, and all the kind of plotting tools, Matplotlib, Octave, uh, and so on, there are plenty of them. They can also be connected to. So I would say you have the possibility to uh, either do visualization right away in Grass. And by the way, this is quite interesting. It is highly optimized. As an example, uh, earlier this year, the NASA uh, DEM, NASA DEM uh, the reprocessing of the SRTM elevation model has been done. It is like, I don't remember, 250 gigabyte of data. If you import this into GRASS, this takes a little bit of time, naturally. It depends on the speed of your hardware as well. But if you say, okay, now I want to see the entire map, you can do so. It takes not much time. Uh, some seconds, I would say, and then you see the entire globe on on in your in the grass display. Uh, why does this happen so quickly when it comes to uh, hundreds of gigabyte of data? Because grass has an on-the-fly reduction tool. So let's say what is known as kind of lazy computation from from other systems. 
uh, you can reduce the, the resolution for the follow-up uh, computation. And then let's say the huge data set is read as reduced uh, resolution. The advantage is if you want to quickly try something uh, on a huge data set, you can do so and you do not have to wait forever. Uh, and then when you are sure that uh, everything is in order and you will get the results uh, you are expecting, then you uh, set it back to the original data set resolution and you uh, retrieve the result. Similarly for the display, because that was the topic, it is reduced on the fly. If you have a monitor with, of course, a limited amount of uh, pixels uh, on the monitor, there's no point in displaying uh, 30 meter pixels of a global map because you won't see the difference. So GRASS does the reduction on the fly also for the display here. And that's why it is very fast in this regard. Marcos, you've given me and the listeners a, a lot to think about here. So I've really enjoyed the conversation up until now. I just have a few final questions for you. Um, and the first one is that I, I think there's a lot of amazing open source software out there. There's a lot of amazing geospatial software out there in, in general. Who is GRASS addressing? Because we, you know, we have the opportunity to do analytical work in other pieces of software. We have visualization packages already. If you had to sort of point at a, a group of people perhaps or a particular use case and say this is made for GRASS, who, who would that be? Yeah, you already mentioned the data scientists. They are, of course, a group being addressed here. Data scientists want to be able to, let's say, analyze even huge amount of data, maybe heterogene from coming from heterogeneous sources. Uh, GRASS is able to, let's say, to funnel this into one system to do the data cleanup at the same time, as I already mentioned. It's very interoperable, uh, so you're not limited to GRASS if you want to bring it into a different final visualization system, no problem with that. But I would say uh, GRASS is addressing those who are uh, in the need of doing complex, even simple uh, geospatial processing of whatever format, of whatever uh, data model, raster, vector, 2D, 3D, time series, and so on. And this is for sure not limited uh, to academia, but uh, it is also something which is uh, supporting business models uh, in all kinds of businesses where it comes to uh, data extraction and, let's say, provision of uh, conclusions or analysis on top of uh, large amounts of data. And as we know, data amounts of data are really, really increasing uh, in the, at this time. Uh, we are luckily uh, having access to many new sources of open data. Open data, I would really May I like to mention here, this is a policy which is really important and bringing forward humankind, in my view, uh, because especially data from uh, public authorities should be available. But then uh, the data are there. Uh, you have maybe LiDAR point clouds and then what? And here we offer a huge range of tools, and those tools are also at a high level of abstraction. Uh, that means uh, you have uh, topical Applications there, fire simulation, solar energy, I already mentioned, hydrology, geology, and so on. So you do not have to reinvent the wheel, but you can just go there and use rock solid tools which have been tested in many environments and optimized for speed. And, and my final question here is well, what do you think grass is going to look like in, in five years' time or, or just generally going forward? Is there any particular direction you would like to see grass and the grass community head in? Yeah, well, uh, for sure, we can uh, see that the open source approach, which I'm following already for yeah, 25 plus years, has been uh, has developed from an academic niche, probably also back then due to the lack of globally accessible Internet to mainstream. So we no longer need for a long time already, no longer need to discuss is, if open source is uh, good or relevant or such. It is. And uh, grass is, of course, uh, well settled there. I believe that in future, uh, a plethora of open data sets will become available and they require a new view on analysis. Having data is one thing, but being able to draw conclusions from data is another one. And here I see grass in a, in a very good uh, shape because due to its modular architecture and flexibility, we can use it as a backend 
in many regards, but uh, we also continue to, let's say, develop the graphical user interface or other interfaces in a way that it is uh, accessible to many. And I'm also pretty sure that more and more people, as it already happened, see the uh, spatial component of many global problems and hence ask for a software which is able to deal with that. And like this, uh, we will continue the development and bring it forward so that such problems can be addressed in a way. Thank you very much, Marcus. I really appreciate your time and I have loved listening to your insights and learning more about Grass Software. Where can the listeners go if they have questions, if they want to learn more, if they want to reach out to you personally? So the first place is, of course, the Grass website, uh, grass.osgo.org. Just relaunched this year, looking beautiful now. There you find all kinds of information. You see uh, where you can start learning. You find the software itself. You find tools and uh, information how to develop the software if you want to start. Then we have the mailing list, uh, which you also find uh, reference there. It is running on the OSGEO domain. And uh, the mailing lists are very friendly. So just post your questions. There is no bad questions uh, we are just uh, happy to help and uh, they are, let's say, ordered in user list and developer list, but it's not very, uh, not a very strict uh, separation. And well, you can, of course, reach out to me, netela at mundialis.de or netela at osgo.org and uh, I'm happy to support you as much as uh, needed and, of course, help you also to navigate in the uh, huge uh, open source GIS community. Thanks again, Marcus. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. So Marcus mentioned a lot of interesting resources during the episode here. I will put links to those in the show notes in, the, in your podcast application. You'll also be able to find it on our website, mapscaping.com. I really hope that you'll take the time to check out the Grass GIS project. It, it really does offer a ton of functionality. It's free. It's open source. You can just download it and and start playing around, start learning. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and it's been a pleasure being your host again this week. You are more than welcome to reach out to me on social media or you can go to our website, mapscaping.com. And yeah, I would love to hear your suggestions, feedback, comments, that kind of thing. It really helps me shape the direction of the podcast. It helps me make it better for you. So any and all input is greatly appreciated. I would really love to hear from you. Okay, that's it for me. We'll talk again next week. Bye.